Okay, but I think we can probably slowly start with the intro. So it's really my, my big pleasure to welcome you, Sam, um, as today's speaker of the Planetary Biology Lecture Series, which has taken off quite well in the, in the past months. Um, so Sam did his PhD at the Université Catholique de Leuven. So I guess actually, Sam, you're from Belgium, right? I am. Yes, yes. Did his PhD there in 2002. And then you got to Sweden yeah, as a postdoc um, at the Royal Ac Swedish Academy of Sciences from 2004 to 7. And then um, Sam became a senior lecturer at the um, University of Gothenburg. And as such, is, um, has his home at the, uh, the Marine Station in Kristineberg um, in, in Sweden. Near, that's near Gothenburg. And Sam investigates the effects of global cha changes. So that's ocean acidification, global warming, mostly on marine species and marine ecosystems. So basically it's a question, how do they evolve in response to these changes? How does their physiolog physiology change and, and what are the, the global consequences? And for this does a lot of experimentation in innovative ways to, to find out about these adaptations to changes and publishes a lot on um, the impact of, of temperature or acidification on different organisms. So going with seeing his public is impressive publication list actually this is on mollusks, the shells of mollusks, sea urchin, brittle stars, fish, um, seagrass ecosystems, corals or copper pots. So that's that's really an impressive um, breadth of, of species and it's it's not only that it's only that it's he's also interested with his group to investigate seafood security and blue growth and is especially active uh, in in the direction of um, how to communicate the scientific results to policymakers and the general public and um, as as such as a communicator of science and, and um, outreach to politicians, for example, he is for a member of advisory boards, for example, the advisory board on ocean acidification, the International Coordination Center and other global networks on, on ocean acidification. So that's very impressive. And um, I guess we will also hear something in this direction today with his title, what science do we need for the ocean we want? So thanks again, Sam, for coming. We are, it's our delight and please go ahead. Thanks a lot for the kind words. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, so yeah, I, I try to, to make a presentation that will cover a little bit of the different part you, you mentioned to, also especially after the talk we had a couple of weeks ago about the, the direction that you guys want to take. So, so I, I, it's more like a reflection about well, what, what do we need today in terms of of marine science if we really want to address the societal challenges we have. So you can see the picture of the marine station on, on there. So I'm extremely lucky. I've, uh, I moved there for a postdoc for what was supposed to be 16 months and it's been 16 years this year. So it's a, it's a little paradise. And if you've never been here, please do. It's a, it's a really great place to work. So the, the, the program of, of, of this presentation and the take home message is, is basically I don't have to convince you of that, but the ocean play a key role in, in, in all our lives, wherever you live. And, and, and we are now entering the, the UN ocean decade, which is a great opportunity to actually promote and do the important science in the next 10 years. But something that I'm really passionate about is that it, it's time to, to act. I think we've been talking a lot about how to change the world or to make it better, but it's really time to actually take action and, and action toward solutions and try to make things better in the future. So we, one of the key message here is that I'm, I'm a big fan of fundamental science and I think we should also promote that, but there is also a need to systematically prioritize science to drive environmental changes. So what we need is, is priorities because we can't do everything, it's action and it's change. So that's, that's basically the key message of the day. So be behind all that, of course, is this symbiotic relationship that we have with, with the ocean. So the ocean is providing us with countless services from the air we breathe, potential substance and so on that are available in the ocean, seafood that is increasingly important these days uh, with growing population, cultural services, the value of biodiversity just by itself, of course, is critical coastal protection and and the very important role that the ocean has uh, in, in controlling the weather and the climate. So we are highly depending on, on the ocean, but the thing is that the reality is that, of course, human population keeps growing and we have 7.8 billion. And according to realistic projection, we should reach 
the plateau around 10 billion by the end of the century, and then hopefully it's going to decrease a little bit. But all this leads to the fact that the human imprint, ecological imprint on the planet is increasing. And one of the consequences is the decreasing ocean health. There are many ways we can estimate this. This is one that's the ocean health index that has its value and its limitation, its limitation. But, but overall, it's showing that the ocean health index is really far from the 100%, which would mean purely, you know, a really healthy ecosystem, uh, really resilient to change. But we are about 60%. And there is a lot of variability in space and in time. I think you can see the, the health index vary between 36 and 86, but you can also see that on the map where some, some countries are doing better than others. And unfortunately, the countries that are doing the worst are developing countries where the dependency towards seafood is much higher. And so they are actually the one that's going to suffer the most. So there's also a solidarity aspect in what we have to, to address in the future, because we want to, to be sure that the more sensitive countries will be able to, to handle this. But one of the things that really changed in, in the last decades is the fact that we, we are used of the local pollution, local destruction of habitat, but no things are also changing on the global scale. So as a, as a species now, we are actually manipulating the ocean globally. And one way that everybody understands is, is, is the plastic pollution. You have plastic everywhere from the deepest ecosystem to, to the most remote uh, position in, in the world. And, and that, that was, in a way, a, a really good communication possibility, like making everybody understand that we have a global imprint on the planet. And, and that's because we are so many. So one of the, the, the numbers that people use regularly is that we basically release in the ocean 25 million tons of plastic packaging every single minute. But so, even then, it, it's not the worst thing we are doing. We, for every truck of plastic that is released into the ocean, we release 114 trucks of something else. And this something else is basically carbon dioxide. So we are producing this ridiculous amount of carbon dioxide that has, you know, it's like about 10 petagram a year these, these, these days, and it's not getting any better, it's increasing. And, and all these, these changes have so much imprint on, on marine ecosystem that we know enter the Anthropocene, not only marine ecosystem, of course, but we basically enter to, to this, this phase where human is a dominating force. In, in, in ecosystem uh, and marine ecosystem, but also terrestrial ecosystem, of course. And, and, and you could separate this, this influence into two different big categories, which are important to, to separate the global impact, from, you know, the CO2, for example, consequences that will be warming, ocean acidification, hypoxia, and so on and so on. And then you have the local aspect, which is habitat destruction or overexploitation of resources. Local pollution, you have more than 100,000 substances out there and you have more every day. The, the reason why it's important to separate this global and local effect is because it's different ways of managing them. You can manage easily locally some of these local impacts, of course, by controlling local source of pollutions or putting some regulation on fisheries. But you can't really do that easily with the global impact. If you want to mitigate the global impact, you have to work globally. That doesn't mean that nothing you can do locally, and we will come to that later. But still, it's important to make the distinction. And we know as a fact that it's going to have dramatic consequences. If we don't, if we keep doing what we do, we're going to have consequences. And, and, and to evaluate these, there are different routes that you can take. You can do experiments in the lab, in the field. You can do some monitoring, of course. Uh, but you can also go back in, in geological time and have and, and have a look of what happened. And, and, and we have in, in the past events that, that were similar to what is happening today. And one example, if you want to compare with climate change, would be the end of the Permian. So what happened at the end of the Permian was that you had a big climate change. And that was due to increased volcanic activity that released a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And as a consequence, we had global warming, hypoxia in the ocean, ocean acidification, and so on. And that led eventually to a huge simplification of the ecosystems, leading to an extinction of 92% of all marine species. Of course, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen now, but that's a good reason to worry, of course. 
But if you take all these kind of evidence from lab, from monitoring, from, from the past, it's the message, the message is extremely clear. And you can just go into the IPCC report, if you don't believe me. Uh, and, and they use really strong phrasing. For example, they use the, 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 the term virtually certain to, to when it comes to consequences of all these changes on marine species ecosystem and ecosystem services. And virtually certain is the highest level of scientific certainty you can get. So we know a lot. We know that things are changing as a consequence of human activities. And we know that there's going to be consequences for ecosystems, us, and, and eco through ecosystem services. So the first stop in, in, in my presentation is that it doesn't matter where you live. You have, the ocean has an impact on you through all these services. You have an impact on the ocean through your ecological footprint. And, and, and this link between the ocean and, and us and our health is really under threat. So there is no doubt that we need to act and we need to act very, very soon. Fortunately, they start to have a recognition of, of these issues at the policy level. And, and when the sustainable development goals were released a few years ago, I was really pleased to see that you had one that was really focusing on the ocean and water, that's the SDG 14. And if you check inside this SDG, you have really important aspects that are covered from, of course, sustainable fishing. So overfishing is one of the most dramatic thing. Habitat destruction, ocean notification was one, and then pollution. So you have all these different aspects that are there and you have most of the countries that actually signed that promise to actually work toward a more sustainable ocean. And even better, like starting this year, you have the UN decade for, of ocean science for sustainable development that, that has this mission really to develop the science we need for the ocean we want. And I think I really like it as a concept because the idea is really to, 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 find, to define the best science we can. The thing is that if you, if you dig a little bit in the implementation plan of, of the United uh, Nations decade, you really realize that basically what they want is more science and more science. And I think that's, of course, that's really needed. But you also have to be careful about that because always asking for more science sometimes is just a good excuse to delay action, right? Because you, you have to wait to know more to actually act. But we know more than enough today to actually act on certain fronts. But there are still things where science is really critically needed because we don't know enough to actually know how to, to manage certain ecosystems because we don't have the ecological understanding or we don't have the data. But what we need to do really is, is be really smart as a scientific community to identify which within this crazy amount of science we could do, which are the things that we can do that within a few years can help the development of solutions or so really action that will restore ecosystem, make them more resilient or address climate change issues. Basically, the, a colleague of mine made this really interesting metaphors where he said like, we are on the Titanic and we spend a lot of time descri describing every single cabin on the boat instead of really focusing on the big picture. And I think that was a good, a good metaphor. Like you know, we don't have the time to go for all the details. We have really to focus on what is the most important. So all science is interesting, but not all science is useful. So as a second stop, we, we are now entering a decade of opportunity where there will be support for scientists. There are call for actions now. There will be different types of support for us to actually deliver really interesting science. But there is a real need to prioritize and focus on solutions. But what kind of options do we have? So in a way, this is the situation we are facing. We are the little mouse facing a huge challenge, which would be all these environmental changes happening at the same time. And if we want to address this challenge, you have three options if you're facing that situation. One, you wait and see, which doesn't seem to be a very smart thing to do, and that's what we should avoid, really. The second thing is kill the cat. If you can do that, that's the best situation. You don't have any problem after that, and you're safe. The third option is you run away, you hide, and you buy some time. And when it comes to response to climate change or environmental changes in general, these are also the three options we have. We wait and see, terrible ID. Two, we kill the cat, which is called mitigation. So for example, it's reducing significantly CO2 emissions and CO2 concentration into the atmosphere. We know it's gonna be complicated, like it would be complicated for the little mouse to kill the cat. 
or you can basically escape the problem or try to avoid the most negative consequences, and that's called adaptation. Adaptation doesn't resolve the problem, the cat is still there, but it allows you to buy some time. And buying time is very important. And in a way, we have to do both in parallel. We need to work toward mitigation, reducing carbon emission, reducing pollution, be smarter in the way we consume and so on. And at the same in parallel, try to avoid the more negative effects. So adapt to the situation to make ecosystem resilience and so on. And again, that's where the scale is very important because many of these issues are global change, global challenges, and to do that, you need basically global agreement, for example, for CO2 emissions, and that's complicated, that's taking time. And then on the other hand, you have local challenges, like the guys that you see on the picture on the bottom here, here are Chinese farmer oysters uh, close to Hong Kong. These guys, they don't really care about what's happening in the whole world. What they want is to keep their business running. They want to keep being able to culture, the oysters and sell them and feed their family. And if you want to help them, you can't really wait to have mitigation magically happen. You have to go there and give them options about how can you keep your business running for the next decades till mitigation is actually achieved. And there are things we can do. I think this is a really cool paper by Jean-Pierre Gattuso that was published in Science in 2015. And they summarize really well what can be done. So if we want to take action, in terms to address like these global issues, you can on one side mitigate, so work toward reduction of carbon dioxide emission or find ways to remove it from the atmosphere. And then there are two things you can do at the ecosystem level. You can protect existing ecosystems. And to do that, you want to keep it biodiverse and resilient. And to do that, you can create marine protected areas. You can decrease the other source of pressure, the pressure you have on the ecosystem like local pollutions or poaching in certain areas, so you can protect it to keep it resilient. Or you can repair them. Many ecosystems have been destroyed and you can invest resources in trying to restore them. One example is planting seagrasses beds or, or replanting mangroves. But you, also, you can also adapt at the societal level and do things differently to be more resilient to these environmental changes when they come. And a good example is adapting aquaculture practices. And I will show you an example in a minute. But still, again, you have all these solutions that are available, but uh, these solutions depends on, on, on what are the priorities locally. So what is really good if you go in one place is see, okay, what are the main challenges for marine ecosystem where I live? Is it overfishing? Is it pollution? Is it climate change? And from there, you can see what kind of uh, solutions are available locally and what is preventing me from implementing these solutions what kind of science is actually missing. So you need a systematic evaluation locally. And that's something that we did a couple of years ago for Norway, for example, and it had a really strong focus for on industry. So we wanted to have industries, keep the ecosystem healthy at the same time. And then we could identify the, the science gaps that need to be addressed there. So basically we need, we need science for sure, but we need the right science for the right purpose. So now I will go you can interrupt me if something isn't clear, if you have questions, right? If not, I'll keep going. And you can, I don't have time, so let me know if I'm going too far. Uh, so I will give you three examples now on how to do that in a very applied and, 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 and clear way. The first thing, first example is adaptation of aquaculture. So there is a story in, in, on the west coast of the US when in 2007, the oyster farmers that are living along the coast there realized that they had a big problem. The way they work is they go in the field, they collect, wild, they collect wild oysters, they bring them into the hatchery and they produce fat. So they basically spawn the oysters, eggs and sperm, they fertilize and they, they grow them in, in laboratory conditions till they reach little juveniles and then they transfer the juveniles back in the field till they can, so they can grow in market size. But that year, none of the oyster farmer along the coast could produce a little fat. And that was really surprising because sometimes it happens in one hatchery because you have a disease or a problem like that, but it's not happening in such a large scale. And so they didn't really know what was the problem. So they called science for help. And this guy called Dick Feely, who is a biogeochemist, came to the, to, the, to the field and made some studies there and realized that the cause of this crash in the oyster industry was ocean acidification. So something needed to be done because if 
they lose like one or two years of production. These guys are out of business. Business, and it was millions of dollars in the balance. So basically, the question like was like, how can we address this, this issue in a time efficient manner? So the problem was acidification. It's well known that acidification is caused by carbon dioxide emissions. So you could you can even identify the main polluters. Like you have all the big oil industries, of course, that are, that are responsible. And the solution is also obvious. We need to reduce carbon dioxide emission. The problem with that is that we know very well that if we want to do that efficiently, it's going to take decades. And these guys at the hatcheries, they don't have decades. They have a year maximum. They need to address this issue very quickly. So in that case, mitigation was not an option. So they had to find some, some other option. And the other option was adaptation. So the other scientists came to the field, talked to them, check how the way they were doing their, their, their aquaculture production and decided to study in, in details the sensitivity of the oyster at different life history stages. And what they realized is that actually the oyster is quite resilient to acidification. So if you, if you expose adults, they do fine. If you expose Bigger juveniles, they do fine. Even the early life, the, the first few hours of development are doing fine. There is this critical window in the development of the oyster that is particularly sensitive to these pH changes. And that's when they move from the trochophore larvae to the D-shaped larvae. And the reason why they are so sensitive to acidification is because that's when they precipitate all the calcium carbonate to form their shell. And this is extremely costly in terms of energy. So they realized that if you do this, this little step here, that is just a few hours in very controlled conditions, after that, you're safe. You can keep doing things the same way you do. So what the oysters actually started to do is basically put much more control on these areas. So they do that either by monitoring the water entering, and if the pH is not good, they shut down and work differently, or they work in closed system where they control the carbon and chemistry of the water and so on. So they basically found a really easy solution. So that was really targeted science, trying to, to solve a problem that was important for the aquaculture industry and basically try to help them to go back into business. And that's what they did. I know they are back into business. So that's a good example of really fundamental understanding of a scientific process that can be applied in the real world for industry. Another example is that that's if you really want to be able to manage ecosystems in the future and provide key guidance for policymakers into what to do and where, for example, where to put a marine protected area or where will be the most sensitive spot for climate changes in the future, you need to be able to make some forecasting. And I was talking with Detlev, and I know that's something that some of you are interested in. So being able to forecast the future changes is one of the key questions in the future. And that's going to be one of the key call for action or action for the UN decade, because that's a very complicated topic and that will require working across disciplines from monitoring at the physical chemical level to understanding the mechanisms of response of the biological mecha mecha mechanistic response to all these changes, how, how, how you have combined effect of multiple stressors. You have so many fundamental questions we need to answer if you want to model these kind of things efficiently. And one of the main problems, if you really want to do that efficiently, is really that it's a multi-stressor question. You have all these changes that are happening simultaneously. And understanding how these things work together is extremely challenging, especially that the combination of driver is different everywhere. I'm not going to have the same combination of challenges in Sweden than you have, you're going to have in Germany or anywhere else. So it's every time a little bit of a different story. So if you really want to address this thing from a management point of view, you have to go to your policymaker with a priority list and say, okay, your ecosystem here is impacted by climate change, by plastic pollution, by pollution, by overfishing. But based on the exposure, the effect, local adaptation, these are the stressors you should address first. Not the, these ones that can wait a little bit, but you should really focus on that. And to do that, you really have to have a deep mechanistic understanding. Because multiple stressors, if you really want to understand, what you need to do is to understand how every individual stressors is impacting your species or ecosystem of choice. So 
you really need to have a mechanistic understanding of, of how the stressor or the driver is impacting your species and your ecosystem. The other thing is that most of many of these stressors are natural, like temperature is something that is naturally fluctuating, pH, oxygen. So you won't have magical like threshold that's going to work for everything. You won't have one temperature that is too high for all the species in the world. You won't have one pH that will be too low for all the species in the world. So you have to, again, take local conditions into account. And then if you have this understanding, you can start to maybe try to understand how they work in combination. So we'll go through these, these three points. So to understand the mode of action, you really need to understand what's happening. And to do that, you can use model species. And that's because the advantage of model species is that first, most of the time you have centuries of data behind you and a lot of really good understanding. And also you have a lot of tools that you can use to answer very complex and specific questions. And the, one of the models we use in my lab is the urchin for exactly those reasons. We have a genome available, we have functional tools to, to manipulate certain things. We have centuries of data. We know it's sensitive to acidification too. And also it's a keystone species where I live and a commercially important. So it's kind of a perfect model combining all these different things. So what we, we wanted to do is understand what's happening inside the serotonin larvae. And we selected larvae because they are particularly sensitive to environmental changes. So we wanted to know what's happening when you expose serotonin larvae to an array of different things. What's happening when you expose them to higher temperature? What's happening when you expose them to low salinity, to low oxygen, to different food concentration or ocean acidification? And because serotonin larvae has been a model for a long time, many of these questions we could already answer just by reading the literature, which was our strength. We didn't have to start from scratch. One of the, question, the, the, the things we didn't know back in the days, what was, was the, pH, the, the, infect, the impact of ocean acidification. So we decided in, my, decided in my lab, okay, let's try to do that. We want to be able to understand, we want to be able to predict what's gonna happen. And for that, we need to understand what's happening to one of those guys. So we started very simply. We were doing ocean acidification experiments where we manipulated the carbonate chemistry of the water in the lab. And then that was one of the first experiments. We just collected serotonins in the field, cloned them, and, and basically exposed the, 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 the fertilized eggs to different pHs and checked what was happening. And, and, and what we saw is, and that's something you see in most marine larvae is that you have a delay in development. So this would be the size and the time, and, the, and the, the, you can see that the size is increased, the larvae increase, increases through time, and that's the high pH and that's the low pH. So basically they grow a little bit slower. And, and that leads to a delay in development of two, three days. And, and that actually can have big consequences for, for the population sustainability because every extra day they spend in the plankton 15% of them are eaten by predators. So the population size decreased by 15% every day. So that, that's, that was the, the main effect we saw with, with this kind of pH change. The next question was really like, why is that decreasing in size? And our hypothesis was that maybe the metabolism was going down as a way to save energy to, when you're in stressing situation. That's one of the strategy. You can decrease your metabolism. So we say, okay, next step, let's, let's basically check metabolism and let's see how, how they respirate under low pH. So we develop you know, some, some methods to actually do that because remember these larvae are one tenth of a millimeter. Um, and so we developed respiration methods that were quite efficient. So it took us a little while to find the right method. But when it was there, we had really cool data because we had respiration rates through time. And you can see that as expected, when they grow bigger, the respiration rate increase. But surprisingly, we had the opposite of what we expected. So we were expecting a decrease in respiration that would explain easily the, the, the slowest growth rate. But actually, they have, we saw an increase in, in respiration rate when you expose them to low pH. So they actually doubled their respiration rate. So that can also make sense, of course. That shows that the organism is fighting against stress. So they need to invest more energy into something. And the next question, yeah, the next question was, what was where do they, where, what, what, where, where is the energy going after this? So where do they invest this extra cost? And to, to resolve that, we thought about two things. It could have anything, something to do with feeding, or it could have something to do with an uh, acid-base regulation, which are two processes that could be pH dependent. 
for acid-base regulation, we thought, okay, let's go inside, inside the sea urchin and see if they control the pH efficiently under control and low pH. And to do that, we had to develop again new methods. So we wanted to go and measure the pH inside the extracellular fluid. But remember, they are really, really small, one tenth of a millimeter. So we teamed up with people in Kiel and, and, uh, and with medical experts that use these microelectrode and we developed microelectrodes that allows to measure pH in very small volumes. So you can see the electrode here entering into the sea urchin larvae and then we could measure pH changes in live larvae through time while we were manipulating the pH outside. But we, also, we were also interested in the pH inside the cells. As you know, it's very important to keep the pH right inside the cells for enzymatic function. And to do that, using an electrode was out of question. Just to show you the, the scale, this, this would be a cell like this little dot here compared to the size of the electrode. So for that, we use pH sensitive dyes so that you can load inside the cells and then the fluorescent will be pH dependent for using confocal microscopy. And to cut a long story short, what's happening is that if you change the pH outside the larvae, it changes accordingly inside the larvae. So they don't really control their extracellular fluid pH. But then when you look at the cellular level, that's a completely different story. First, the pH goes down, but within a few minutes, the pH goes up again. And to do that, they actually use different types of pump and a lot of proton pumps that use ATP to regulate the pH inside the cell. And there, since then, there has been estimation of how much energy are used by a sea urchin larvae to regulate the pH inside the cells, and it could be up to 60% of their all energy budget. So they use more energy for pH regulation when they are exposed to low pH. And the second side, as I said, was the feeding. How much energy can they acquire? And again, we were not really happy with the methods that were available at the time. So we decided let's, let's use another approach. And what we did is basically put the sea the, 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 the urchin larvae under the confocal microscope, start filming while we were changing the food concentration, the pH, and so on. And then we used two different types of fluorescence, like the autofluorescence of the chlorophyll. So we could visualize the living algae. So that's a red dot here. So that's phytoplankton. And, and then in green was the digestive chlorophyll. And by doing so, we could start quantify things really well. So you can see in the movie that they use ciliates to attract the food into the, the mouth, then into the esophagus here. Here we go. Then you have a contraction. It enters the stomach, and you can basically see digestion in action. So you can actually see the cells getting digested, how much energy is incorporated into the stomach, and then you have expression. So this is very simple to do. It's just super time consuming to, to do it and also to analyze the data afterwards. But that was really, really good because what we could see is that uh, it, we could actually count really how, how much they were eating and so on. And we also used the same electrodes to go and measure the pH inside the stomach. And that was surprising too, because we basically realized they had an alkaline stomach, which seems to be an efficient strategy to digest phytoplankton. So again, to cut a long story short, what's happening is that if you decrease the pH outside, the pH inside the stomach decreases a little bit and decrease the efficiency of the enzymes by 20%. And the way they cope with that is increasing the, the feeding efficiency. So they are actually increasing the feeding by working more on the ciliates and they increase their feeding by 20%. So at the end of the day, they receive the same amount of energy, but it costs more energy to the larvae to actually capturing this. So meaning that this is another source of the extra cost. So we measured a bunch of other things, and I'm not going to bother you with this, but that's, that's basically the story we had at the end. So we started to really understand the mode of action and the mechanisms where you have a certain amount of energy that is available for the larvae. Some is used for calcification, so we estimate it at that 10%. Some is used for maintenance, and whatever is left, the larvae is using it for growth. I think they try to promote the fastest growth as possible. And then when you expose them to low pH, you have extra costs. So you have extra costs for pH regulation and digestion, also extra costs for maintenance. The cost for classification is the same, but at the end, you have less energy available for growth. So we have a theoretical framework that allows us to actually understand a little bit how these things works, where the lower the pH, the higher the maintenance cost. And at some point you hit what we call a physiological tipping point where they don't have enough energy to actually cope with it. And then they start to go into developmental trouble and mortality eventually. 
we tested this hypothesis by doing an experiment where we had a wide range of pH covering today and future variability. And that's exactly what we saw. We had plasticity zone, we call that, where the lower the pH, the decrease slowly their, their growth rate. But then you hit the point where there's not enough energy to function normally. They go into abnormal development and they start dying. So that's, that's what we saw. And interestingly, the tipping point we were observing was really close to the extreme of the present material variability that they have in the field. All right, what time is it? Can somebody tell me because I don't have the time here just to see if I speak too much. You are still going fine. It's 2.38 uh, now. All right, well, I tried not to make it too long anyway, thanks. Yeah, to have some 10, 15 minutes for questions would be ideal. Super, so I try to speed up a little bit. Uh, thank you. So, so basically, uh, the next step is like uh, the understanding that no, we have a good we had a good understanding of the functioning of different drivers. So I showed you for pH, but we had similar information for temperature, salinity, and so on. So we start to have a good understanding of all these things works individually. The important things that you want to consider is that, as I mentioned before, if you're interested in the impact of all these environmental changes on a given organism, and you're interested in things like acidification, temperature, and so on, there won't be a magical threshold that will work for everything. There is not, a, as I said before, one temperature that is too much for all species or one pH that is too low. And that's because of local adaptation. So if you go in the deep sea, for example, to the vents, the conditions are really brutal there, really high temperature, a lot of toxic in the water. pH is extremely low, 5.4, but still you have calcifiers, you have life there, and they just develop the right mechanisms to actually cope with it. And that's true everywhere around the world. Like stress is basically only happening when you deviate from what you know and what you actually adapt it to. So the the threshold that we're going to identify for temperature, salinity, acidification, and so on will be relative to the present natural viability. So that's why it's so important to combine biological experiments locally with a good understanding of the physical chemical chemistry. You need to be able to understand the environment, the niche of the organism, to understand what the stress is and what future conditions could be too. And everything varies. It varies in space, so you have huge biogeographical difference in temperature, pH, salinity, and so on. Uh, but also in time, you have huge temporal variability at different scales from you know, the short-term variability of a daily, like the balance between photosynthesis and, and, and respiration create this daily variability, for example. And that can be sometimes really big. It depends where you are again. Like this is an open ocean example where you have really narrow variability because there's not so many parameter modulating the variability. But if you go in the coast, the variability in pH, for example, will be drastic and huge because of currents, because of biological activity and so on. And you need to characterize that if you want to predict biological sensitivity because the organism responds to short-term changes. So they don't respond to average temperature. They would respond to extreme temperature. That's how evolution works. So if, if you want to characterize the, the niche of an organism, you really need this short-term variability. Taking one measurement at one time tells you nothing. You need really to characterize at least the, the, the seasonal variation and the daily variation. And that's very important because I can really explain some things that were puzzling at the beginning, for example, of the ocean acidification. So I was working with colleagues in Chile, and this guy has been publishing quite a lot of paper on the impact of acidification on a wide range of species here. And what they showed is that sometimes you test the same pH level or same TCO2, which is the same kind of idea. So they were testing two different CO2, like one representing today, one representing a, a given future. They were testing different organisms and comparing two different populations for every organism. So one along the one or the other along the coast of Chile. And sometimes same species, same scenario, completely different end results. So when you are checking, for example, here, the copepods, same species, same scenario. And in one case, you have a negative effect. And in one case, you have a positive effect. That's super annoying because if you want to make some projection and actually it's so locally dependent, how can you explain that to a policymaker? What we thought is that is because what was neglected in this thinking is the local adaptation again. 
So what we did is went back to all these different populations and started measuring the variability. And we did that over at least a year. And you can see that depending on where you are along the coast of Chile, the variability for pH is very different. In some places like here, variability is huge. And actually the scenario that was tested is well within the present natural variability. So it's not really a stress. This is just something they experience naturally. Where if you go to other population like here, the variability is much narrower. And then what was tested as a future scenario was really a stress. So same scenario, but different interpretation. This is plasticity, this is natural, this is a stress never experienced before. So when you combine these two ideas, you can reevaluate the literature. And instead of taking the absolute value of pH or PCO2 that was tested, you can see how much the scenario deviates from what the organism knows. And that's what we did with this index of variability here. So what does that say is that the more you go on the right, the more the tested scenario in the paper deviate from the extreme of what the organism is experiencing today. And when you do that, you reconcile the whole Story. Like all these things that look contradicting before actually make sense. The more you deviate from what you know, the more negatively impacted you are. So if we found threshold for warming, for acidification, for oxygen, it will be relative to the variability. So that's, that's kind of one of the key message if you want to understand and make some projection is that you need to monitor in the field. You need to actually like for the physical chemical environment, you need to think about it in your design about what kind of scenario to test and so on. You need to understand the mechanism and so on. And for the last part, and I guess I'll stop after this, it's after that, if you have a good understanding of this relative threshold of this, of this uh, mode of action, you still have to resolve how these things work when combined. And I will use a silly example to illustrate that, is that combination of effects are never linear. So you never expect if you have a stressor A and a stressor B, if you want to predict the combined effect, it's never gonna be a mathematical addition. A good example is my dancing skills. So if you plot my dancing skills against my alcohol level in my blood, actually I think it's improving if after a few beers because I'm less shy and I just like to let go. Okay, so if I have a little beer, it's terrible. If I drink a little bit, it's getting better, but there is a limit to it. At some point, if you drink too much, your dancing skills goes really, really low because you're too drunk, actually. And that would work for any kind of stressors and any kind of endpoint. It can actually, if you increase temperature, it's going to go a little bit better. If you're increasing too much, it's going to actually go down. So you don't have linear effects. So trying to understand how the age and temperature or temperature and, and, and the pollutant will work in combination is not just a mathematical, mathematical addition. You need to understand this performance curve and all things in combination and how potentially they can interact. Because sometimes you have complex interactions that can happen. That's why you need the mechanistic understanding. Again, if you want to understand what happens if you drink a few beers and a glass of wine, it's easy to understand because it's the same mode of action. It's basically increasing the amount of alcohol in your blood. But then if you start to mix alcohol with some pills, then you can have interactions that are not just easy to predict by understanding both drivers independently. So if you want to understand multiple drivers, you need to make the effort of understanding the mechanisms, the mode of action, and the performance. So it's quite a lot of work. And there's a lot of gaps there. And that's why we need financial supports to actually do that properly. And, and that we, we identified that with some colleagues at the IOC UNESCO. We made a working group and basically we are working toward now making a document for policymakers, for science policy to try to have calls for project and so on. But here, there is a clear science gap. If we want to be able to model the future, we need to actually monitor properly. So there are many things we can do. We need proper monitoring. We need mechanistic understanding. We need a good understanding of how stressors work in combination. And I think I'm going to pass that example. So if, I think we can talk in the individual group if you're interested. That was more about the communication aspect. And the idea was most of the time, the science we do is very inefficient if we want to drive individual change in terms of communication. So there's also a way of doing science that way you can prioritize the species you use, the endpoints you select, and so on to actually drive change, and it can work. But I think it's great if we keep time for questions. So I hate when people do that. I'm going to skip till the end. And, uh, and just reach the, the, the conclusions. So basically, 
we still need science. If we really want to address all these global challenges, if we want to have a healthy and productive and sustainable ecosystem in the future, we need science for sure. And there are tons of stuff that needs to be done, and, but we can't really wait 10 years. We can't wait for the end of the decade to act. We have to find who act now. So identify the problem locally, identify the solutions, identify what is actually limiting the implementation of the solution and be really systematic. So that's, that's basically the way to go. And it's a huge challenge, of course, but that's a challenge that I'm actually willing to take and I'm pretty sure you too. So that's why I'm really excited to keep the discussion going after this to see what direction you guys want to do. And I was, I was actually talking about the moon landing with my kids and we were listening to the, to the Kennedy speech, you know, we choose to go to the moon. And I realized like it's exactly the challenge we are facing to them. We can just replace, replace, go to the moon by protect the ocean, and we have a really nice speech saying we choose to protect the ocean in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, what we are willing, what we are unwilling to postpone, and what we are intending when we intend to, to win and the other two. So basically, this is exactly the spirit of the decade now. We should work together and try to address this huge challenge. And I'm sure we can do that together. And I'm gonna stop here and uh, hopefully we're gonna have nice discussion now. Thanks, thanks a lot for the opportunity. I'm really grateful to be able to talk to you guys. Thank you very much, Sam. That was indeed very, very nice. Um, are there questions? That's the best part now. Yes, <laughs> um, maybe, maybe I can start, um, Sam. So you, you, of course, had a nice, nice image in the beginning with a cat and whether to kill the cat or whether to, to, to look for shelter somewhere. And I think then you talked a lot about um, monitoring and actually understanding how complicated, for example, for, for ocean acidification, it, it is to understand even, mm -hmm. well, there, there are no general thresholds. You have to understand um, the local conditions to, to somehow acquire first understanding so doesn't this in a way imply that um, it will be very difficult by by understanding these complex um, conditions that are even then locally very dependent to to do something efficiently and doesn't it mean that at the end um, you have to reduce the acidification unless you will not be able to to mitigate anything that's a great question and actually when I show you the graph with all the potential options that we have today, right? All these different options that are available to, to keep the ecosystem healthy and, and, and resilient to these changes like acidification, you have two, two different categories. And I should have said that you have the specific and the aspecific options. So the aspecific options will be options that are available right now and will make things better. One is marine protected areas. We know that is increasing resilience. So the, the, the negative effect of different things on, on marine protected areas is half uh, compared to a non-protected non one. So we know that increasing the surface of marine protected area is gonna have a positive effect. We don't need more data for that. We can, we can implement that right away. And that's one of the indicator of the SDGs. You have other things like that, reducing source local pollution, also efficient being better at doing fisheries. We don't need more data for that. And all these things indirectly contribute to the ecosystem resilience and will help acidification, will help warming. So it will delay you know, by, by a few decades, hopefully, the negative impacts. And then you have the more specific uh, consequences. And that would be something where you need more data, of course. And, and that will take time. But it's all a question about buying time. So by, by working toward implementation of the yeah, specific things, we buy time to develop the specific one. And by implementing the specific one, you buy time for mitigation. And it's actually nice when, when you have local issues to make a timeline. So, you know, like we have, what am I going to achieve in the next 20 years? And what are the options that I can use at the different time scales? And what kind of science do we need? Of course, having these projections, it, it's, it's a long-term plan. And that's why, you know, it took me five years to develop the mechanistic understanding to have to have a, a, a physiological model that I'm comfortable with. And still it's a model, it's not perfect, but, yeah. but that, that, that's, you know, that's, that's one step at a time, but it's, you're right. You have to focus on implementing the most urgent strategy right now. And there are some options. Yeah, thanks. Um, Pierre. Uh, thanks, great talk. 
I just have uh, two related questions in a way. So, so zooming in acidification, it's one of probably 500 environmental parameters that hit and you study one versus my organism or an isthmal group or so. So how can you ensure that, that not 50 other factors are, are, are mingled into that, that you, know, uh, you might buffer some increased acidification with something else that you might not even know yet. You know, some things like nutrients and organic compounds, maybe even plastic, whatever. I mean, uh, you know, physical properties. Uh, uh, compensate for those effects. So it's part one and part two, even if you take that aside, uh, acidification, how can you make, I mean, there's a general correlation, obviously, and that you nicely shot it out, but how can you be sure it's not just extreme at some point, not the average that matters and, you know, some aspects of it. So, so you know, for me, it's hugely complex. Of course, you have to start somewhere, but but how do I get, a, get an idea that it goes in the right direction, the conclusions, I mean? I, I, think, I think it's really tough questions, but thank you for that. But, but you know, in a way, that's the challenge, absolutely. It's like, the, so first, the idea that acidification is just one driver among uh, an infinity of other things that could modulate it. it it's, it's basically the same question in any kind of, eco, even in ecotoxicology and so on. What I like about the acidification community is that it's really well organized. And, 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 and about six, seven years ago, you had a, a position paper where you had hypothesis about what actually matters. So they identified, for example, three different axes where we need more information. One was, was the importance of, of multiple stressors. So basically all these things interact and also modulating factor like food. Food is really well known access to food to modulate the response. The other one was, was uh, ecology. You know, ecology is hugely important in controlling ecosystems. So the role of ecological interactions in actually buffering these effects too, and also evolution. So evolution because most of the experiments were short term where we know that the adaptation potential, you know, all these things. And then the, you had part of the community starting to address all these, these aspects in a really organized way. I think that's, that's not something that one person can answer, but the community is, is working in the right direction. But you're right, there are very likely things we are missing. Very, and, and that's also the cool part about science is like, you know, you learn all, as you go. The second part of the question was about extremes, what is actually driving the response. And, and for that, I would say that they are, it's the same for temperature and so on. There are a lot of arguments that your organism respond to the weather and not to the climate. So the climate is like these long-term changes that we see and, and basically is driving the weather, so the short-term fluctuations. And most of the time from an evolutionary point of view, selection works with extremes. Uh, and, 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 and that's what is important, but, but I think that's, that's again, sure, I don't, I'm not sure I have the correct answer for that. I think that's, that's, what the, that's what we tend to see. We compare this index I showed you, for example, with, uh, you know, to, 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 to say the deviation from the present variability, so the, 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 the Chilean story. We compare uh, the, the average and the extremes, ju just as, as an exercise, and both are in the paper, actually. And we just submitted a new paper to Nature Climate Change. We have a bigger data set now. And, and using extreme is much better predictor than using the average. So I think that's that's a personal view, but we have some arguments for it. So I hope I, I answered part of your question. It's a really tough one. So I'm not sure it's possible yeah. to answer everything, but. Deliberately, Sue, we only go for the challenges. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah, Phil. Hi, Sam. That was a cool talk. Um, I Thanks. noted when you selected a case study to talk about, um, well, the, the case study where you talked about the, I guess, the oysters on the west coast of, of the US, um, how they had their most sensitive period uh, was kind of this, this transition from the tropophore larvae down to the D-shaped um, larval period. And I guess I, you, you studied what you studied with the case study, but of course the trichophore is also a, a kind of a, a key developmental stage in a lot of animals that mm. are somewhat related. In this case, that happened to be the most sensitive stage, but do you think, do you have uh, other information I don't know about, about other species? Is that generally a very sensitive time point for most species or is it just that oysters, that was their weak point? I, I think every trans major developmental transition is sensitive because it requires quite a lot of energy to basically change, like to, to, to reorganize. So when you have massive transition, for example, where sea urchin, when they start building their rudiment, just, you know, that's super expensive to actually do that. So they are very sensitive, but there is something specific about the bivalves in the sense that there is really this extreme, it's really extreme the precipitation of the, of the skeleton. And 
And uh, there is a the, the paper I cite, I can, I can share the slides if you want, you can check it, the work by, by George Wellbesser and colleagues. They really show that there, there is a kinetic of, of energetical investment at that window that, that really makes a difference. So I think it's, that would be a rule that every transition matters, but this is a really extremely sensitive transition. So it might not be the same in, in other organisms. It's, it's when you have a unique period of, of precipitation of calcium carbonate, which costs a lot of energy. Thank you. Thanks, Cornelius. Um, hi, yeah. Um, thanks a lot. That was great. Um, I was, you, you made it very clear that we can't understand everything in a short period of time and that the choices are really important. So my question would be, if you had to start your career over again, which organism would you pick and why? That's, that's a good one. I, I actually would not pick only one. I think that's what I did. I think that I mentioned that I worked on a bunch of things from bacteria to fish and I used, you know, the, the Crocs principle. So the Crocs principle is, is basically for any question, you're going to have an organism that is better suited to answer the question. So that, that, that's why, for, for example, for the mechanistic understanding, go for a model species, because that will give you so much more opportunity to go into details. If you're interested in, in, in gene expression, gene manipulation, or gene regulatory network, and you start with a new model organism, it's going to take you a lot of time to, to parameterize everything. So it, it's not efficient. So using an established model would be great. Now, if you're interested in, in, in specific questions, you're going to use different organisms. Like I, I did experiment on, on evolutionary aspects, like basically adaptation potential. I'm not going to use a fish that needs five years for reproduction in that case. So we used short-lived, short, no, high, uh, with short reproduction period. We use copepods in a week to have a generation. So in that case, that gives you opportunities uh, to, to, to do more complex experiments. Then, then if you're interested in so if you're interested in, in communication, use a charismatic species, you know, something that people eat, some people think that people care. A colleague of mine used clownfish and he made a whole PR about Nemo couldn't find his home. So it was really successful. So I, I my strategy, and I think that's something I did from the beginning, and I think that's a relatively good one, is that I have one model organism for my complex question, and that's here Chin Lave, and I do a lot on that. And then for the rest, I just adapt to the question. So, you know, we use bacteria for fast growing stuff. We use uh, so, some, some benthic commun like communities to study community response. And of course, every time you make a choice, you have limitations associated to it. You can't really translate what you learn from a copper pot to a whale, but that tells you something about the mechanism. And I think I, I'm really a mechanistic guy, you know, that if it's ecology evolution or, because mechanisms, you can, you can first, it's going to stay longer than whatever paper you publish on acidification, but also that allows you to upscale and interest a lot of people. And actually, hopefully, some of these processes can be transferred across organisms, across ecosystem, and so on. So one, one model organism that you like and you master for complex question, and the rest, you just adapt to the question. Thanks. Thanks. Sam, there's, there's one last question from Anastasia. Uh, how efficient are we scientists at communicating our findings to governments and international organizations, um, as for example, the United Nations? I guess you have a lot of experience in this and maybe you can give, give a quick hint. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a good question. And, uh, and it can be a really frustrating exercise actually, because you have to talk to a, wide, a range of different audience from policymakers at different levels, like global, local economists, citizens, kids, and all these or journalists, all these people have different goals. They want different things from you. Like a journalist want a story, a policymaker, they don't want to hear about problem, they want solutions. So the way I realized to make it efficient is, is come really prepared. And that means understanding the language, understanding what is expected and, and basically provide what they need. Uh, I, I remember we had an European project called EPOCA about uh, acidification, and at the end of EPOCA, we were invited by the European Commission to present the, the results. And, and the way it was presented is like, oh, acidification is bad, it's going to have a lot of negative impact, and so on. And one of the policymakers raised his hand and said, you scientists, you always come with bad news. And that was over, because we didn't really come with real solution, which is really what they wanted. They say, okay, I, I know we have a problem, but what shall we do about it? So in that, that's why I talk so much about solutions and stuff like that, because that's the language you need to speak for policymakers. And then 
the way you do it the most efficiently. I mean, you have big reports like the IPCC. If you have the opportunity to contribute to that by your science or by other contributing author or a chapter, that's great because these things have an impact. No, does it really need to change? I'm not sure. But for me, the most efficient way I found to communicate was to have personal contacts. So I went to the UN, to the UN Commission, and I gave talks there, and I'm not sure it had any kind of impact. But then I met people that I actually build trust with. And these people will contact me when they have questions. And I think that's an efficient way of driving at least a little bit of change because they, they hopefully will listen to you in, in, in a better way. But it's, it's frustrating because you have so many complexity in driving change in society that it's what we do is just like, you know, a grain of salt sometimes, but still I think we have to, to keep fighting hopefully to drive the change on the long term. The more satisfying is communicating with kids because they, they listen and they are willing to actually do things about it. Yes, I think it's very, it's very energizing to hear also this, this grain of optimism from your side that, that there are in fact things you can do and that there, once you do it, it is also maybe um, encouraging to, to continue. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, we, we will leave it with this here now, Sam. Thanks a lot. Yeah, our, our time is over. Thanks a lot for really an insightful presentation, both on these general aspects as well as interesting science um, in, in the detail. I think that was very helpful for us. There will be a lot more questions, I'm sure. We have some more discussions with you now and maybe also beyond that, then the opportunity to interact. So Sam, thanks again for, for coming, for, for um, giving this this lecture and um, yeah, see you later soon again. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks again. Being. Nice meeting so. you all. Thank you.